All right. Good to see everyone. Great to be here again. Uh, I'm Rob Tatro from robtatro.com, portfolio manager here at Canaccord Genuity Wealth Management. Today, we are talking about the ongoing ripple effects of a short squeeze. Now, we've talked about it at length uh, on this show a week ago. We covered it in depth exactly one week ago, spent an hour on it. Uh, I had my dad live from Marchand. The reception wasn't great. The internet, we'll blame it on a storm. We'll blame it on something. Uh, the internet wasn't working great that day. But today we got uh, Claude in the city. First time in the city since November. Uh, the city of Winnipeg, the metropolis of Winnipeg coming in. So our objective today is to cover, first of all, do some analysis. What happened? Where are we at today? We want to take a look at what the future implications will be for the market. We want to take a look at um, regulations, what's going to happen there, the future of this type of short squeeze, this event, the shorting firms, the hedge funds, what's going to happen there. We want to cover it all. We want to take your questions. And more importantly, we want to hear from the Oracle, my father, Claude Tatro. Let's bring him in. Claude, good to have you here. Happy to be here. All right. So uh, they used to call you Curly back in the day, but uh, for me, you've always been the Oracle because you've been uh, you've been so right with so many of these throughout my career. And um, I guess it's for you, it's experience. I'm not going to tell the viewers how old you are, but uh, you probably have close to 50 years experience in doing this kind of stuff, at least in uh, in your career. You know, uh, I said it last week, but I'll say it again. Bond trader, you've you've worked at the banks. You were. Uh, what was it, CEO of a credit union. You eventually became a stockbroker, rolled into uh, investment uh, advisor, sorry, investment banking, uh, an investment advisor, and now uh, the senior strategist at the Tatra Wealth Advisor Group. Claude, what do you think of everything that's happened over the last week? I'll start with a, a bit of a, an open-ended question. How do you, you know, you were watching from your office in Marchand. Um, you know, what did you make of the whole, the whole short squeeze? Well, yeah. What I made of it is that uh, I'd seen this story before, so I wasn't surprised at the start of it, but the magnitude just blew me like that, that was unprecedented. Um, normally, short squeezes are done on, on illiquid stocks, maybe even penny stocks and that sort of thing, but to, to do a short squeeze um you know on a new york stock exchange traded stock uh that i had never seen before have you ever orchestrated tried to orchestrate a short squeeze against the stock have i yeah have you ever kind of got together with your buddies back in the day you knew that someone was short a stock somehow you got a tip and did you ever try to kind of pull a short squeeze off no actually i i never did uh but I, it'd be hard I was, to do I, I was on the receiving end of it many many years ago but i never tried to do one I could, I could do one now if, uh, you know, if, if I had the energy and uh, uh, had the will to do it. I know how to do it, but I'm just not going to do it. How would you do it, Claude? If you, how would you do it? You'd go on Reddit? You'd create well, a username? That's actually, the way the Reddit guys uh, uh, did it, it's just that in, in the old days, there was no internet or, you know, or forums like, or like Reddit. So it was a lot more difficult. Today, it's it's a lot easier now that I've learned from the Reddit guys how to orchestrate a 2021 short squeeze. So uh, take a sec to subscribe if you're watching on YouTube, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, wherever you're watching. Take a sec to subscribe, uh, like, share, you know, do all that fun stuff. I want to tell you a story, Claude. You, you probably know this story. The short squeeze of 1869, these two cowboys uh, had gotten the ear of President Grant and they figured out that the only real supply of gold weekly was the U.S. Treasury kind of supplying gold for the markets. Got the ear of President Grant through his sister, was married to his sister or cousin of his sister, something, sat down with the president, convinced the president to stop doing that, effectively stop, you know, the, the influx of, of supply, went out and quietly bought, these guys bought all the gold on the street. And all of a sudden, what happened, right? There was no, this is New York, 1869. They bought all the gold, bid it up, bid it up, bid it up. All of a sudden, no gold. Price, uh, prices doubled back then. Oil, uh, gold is about 20 bucks an ounce. And, and, you know, it went to like 150 or 180 or something like that overnight. And then on a Black Friday, President Grant found out about the plan, got upset, and immediately released $4 million of U.S. gold as a supply. The price crashed overnight, went to basically zero. The stock market dropped 20%, 20% back then. And these guys 
we're broke. The tune of they they did about a billion dollars back then, the equivalent of a billion dollars today. Uh, that's the first short squeeze that I know and remember of in New York, and I remember reading about it in my MBA. These were two guys trying to do it on their own, trying to do it with one supply. Nowadays, thousands and thousands and millions of millions of redditors. What do you make of the power of the God? And actually, maybe I'll just ask you this: What do you think their end game was from the start, Claude? Well. I believe that the originators of uh, the short squeeze was to make money. You know, they, they looked at the reports and they saw that, wow, this company is uh, short 134% of, of its, uh, of its stock. Uh, you know, if, if we can start buying, um, these guys are going to get margin calls, that kind of thing. And we can probably get it up and, and double or triple our money. But I, I think that's how it originated. That would be the way to do it, but never in their wildest dreams. Uh, I think that they ever think that they could get it up to $482. Do you really think though that, so you think the original, do you really think that the rest of the participants were really aware that this was a short squeeze and that this is what they wanted to do? Or do, they, do you have that much faith in them? Yeah, I, I think the leaders. Okay. Uh, I mean, it was well thought out. Uh, I'm just jealous of them that I wish, you know, uh, because in my previous life, I'm the type of guy that looks at the short interest uh, report whenever they come out. They used to come out every two weeks. Now they come out every week. And uh, I always look to see if if there's a stock that is has really jumped its, its short position. And it gives me a clue of, of two things, right? It tells me that uh, usually the, the big volume shorters are sophisticated uh, people. That's all they do for a living. They have all the tools in their toolbox of the trade for analysis uh, and that kind of thing. And, 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 and if they make up their mind that, that a company is overvalued, uh, they will short, you know, like a million, five million, 10 million, depending on the size of their fund. But it's well thought out and it's well, and, and they think that the stock is going down. And, and that's why they do it. So, so when I'm looking at the short report, uh, there's two reasons why a stock will be heavily, will, all of a sudden will be shorted. One is that there's a lot of people that think that that, that stock is overpriced. And the second reason is there could be a lot of hedges. Uh, you know, I can explain that later, but if you're long call options, there's nothing wrong with being short stock if you're protected with, with call options which is a little more complicated. but which is, general, why, which is why most of the volume on shorting happens in the first place. Pardon me? Which is, why most, which is why and how most of the volume on short happens in the first place. It's typically a hedge against an option yeah. strategy. Yeah, most, like, there's nothing wrong with shorting, and I, can get, I, could, I could talk half an hour on, 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 on all the good it does to the market. It's healthy for the market to, to have a regular amount of shorting in the market. But what happened to GameStop is is a totally different story. Let's talk about that. What do you think the ramifications are? First off, we de I debated last week by myself because uh, your internet wasn't working. And I know we you and I have debated this over a while. What are the immediate ramifications, you think, first off, for uh, the, the the retail investor, uh, you know, like our clients that are watching right now? And I, I guess what it's a leading question, but basically – you know, do they really have anything to worry about, like our clients or the retail investor that's not shorting, that's not kind of getting involved into this, etc.? No, I I don't think that they have anything to 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 worry. If 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 you're the typical investor, you know, you're 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 buying for a long term and you're buying blue chip stocks uh, based on fundamentals. You know that you know it's it's good value. Companies keep making money. Uh, it's not going to affect you whatsoever. Yeah, it, it won't. And I'm the portfolio manager. And I can tell you guys that we had none of these stocks. We had none of the stocks that were short. We owned a little bit of some of these, you know, just because for whatever reason. Uh, and, you know, we obviously took the position to take profits when they rallied uh, the positions that we did have. But the vast majority of our clients had zero exposure to this. And had they just, you know, kind of fell asleep a week ago and woke up today, the story didn't even exist and didn't even hit their portfolio whatsoever. Now it did happen that the short squeezing ended up having to sell some of the large caps and the large caps fell last week. And now as the short covering kind of ceased this week, we're seeing a rally 
in the large cap stocks, the Amazons, the Googles, you know, anything large cap, anything tech, anything banks, uh, pretty much North American has rallied a lot this week. And I do think, and I think most analysts would agree that that's just money moving from covering the short sto- shorts to, to being long. Um, also really good earnings. I mean, I'm not sure if you saw the Google and the Amazon earnings uh, this week, uh, viewers, but it was just rock solid. Um, but let's talk about the the impact on the Redditors, the Wall Street betters. What do you think is going to happen to them? First off, I'm going to ask you emotionally and in the future, what do you think, how do you think this is going to play out in their minds? Well, uh, how to, to how it's playing out is you, you see it on all the TV stations on BNN and CNN. Yeah, but not everyone's watching BNN every day like okay. us, right, Claude? Okay, but... The, 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 there's a lot of talk out there that it's the fault of the regulators, right? That uh, the reason that we lost or that we couldn't short that day or we couldn't buy it that day is that uh, uh, Robin Hood, as you know the story, at some point, I think it was last, fr- last Thursday Friday. afternoon or last uh, Friday morning, um, <coughs> when Robin Hood announced that to all their clients that they would not accept any more orders on eight or ten or twelve stocks, so so the 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 Reddits or the Robin Hooders um, automatically blamed. Well, there's something wrong with the system that they're not allowing me to buy, and they're blaming it on regulation. But yeah, Claude, angry. I think I'm going to stop you there. I I don't know if you can necessarily quantify the entire group as saying they all blamed it. I don't think that's a fair statement. I don't think you could say they all blame the regulators. I think the media definitely said that. The yeah. media definitely said that there are people that are upset about that. But I don't think you can make a blanket statement that they're all upset at the regulators for sure. Anyways, go ahead. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I didn't mean all the people, but I mean, th- there's a lot of anger there uh, blaming the regulators and saying the regulators uh, should step in. And it's unfair. The, the hedge funds have an advantage over the small uh, traders because the hedge funds uh, could buy or sell or do whatever they did. However, the people that had accounts with with uh, discount brokers, a few of them, and uh, I'm going to name Robin Hood because they're right as part of the story, is they're the ones, Robin Hood is the one who said, you cannot buy these stocks anymore. And uh, so so a lot of investors are, are thought they was the regulators, but Really, a Robin Hood is is a small broker or now a big brokerage house, and they're regulated by the by the regulators, and they they, they need because the clients of Robin Hood or Canaccord or Royal Bank will never lose money on these things because uh, there's insurance, right? So if ever Robin Hood goes under or any firm goes under, the clients are the clients cannot lose. Yeah. So on that point, just for the viewers. So there's something called the Canadian Investor Protection Fund in Canada. If a firm goes insolvent because of their balance sheet, because they didn't properly manage their shorts, because they didn't properly manage their options, or they just go belly up, as a member of an IROC licensed firm, you pay, we pay into it. Canaccord, as an example, Robinhood pays into this insurance, Canadian Investor Protection Fund, and they guarantee the accounts up to a million dollars of cash for every single account. So the Robinhooders no, no one's going to go and solve. And I don't believe there's been a claim on the CIPF since the mid eighties, I think. So you're right. No, nobody's going broke owning stock, right? Nobody's going broke owning stock. I mean, unless your stock goes to zero, but if, if the firm goes insolvent, nobody is going broke owning stock is the point you want to make. Keep going. Yes, that's the point I want to make. Uh, because as a previous owner of a small investment firm, uh, I understand how it works is that if, if, if our clients, if we go belly up, our clients are not going to lose anything. But me as an investor in my firm, I will lose all my money. So a- as an owner of a brokerage firm like Robin Hood, I want to make sure that that we don't go out of business or go bankrupt. So when all of a sudden stocks are that volatile, like GameStop, the regulators are imposing uh, capital restrictions on Robin Hood. And they're telling them, Look, if, if you if you want to continue to trade like you're doing on risky stocks and very volatile stocks, you have to put more capital in like your insurance policy. I'm, I'm trying to oversimplify or else you won't be able to trade. So so Robin Hood, in order not to have to get a technically a margin call on their firm from the regulators, had a choice. They either had to 
put billions of dollars, okay, but oh, they're capital, a small part. Cash, cash. Yeah, they, they, they had like overnight, they, like the regulars, I, I don't know that for a fact, but I'm just going by past experience, is that for, 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 for every position that you own, you got to put like a little reserve on the side for, for like the insurance. And, and when the stocks are volatile like that, the, the your premium or the amount of capital you got to put up with the regulators increases. And obviously Robinhood signing like 100 million clients a day during this game stock thing, they just didn't have the capital. I, I'm speculating here that they did not have the capital to continue. If another 100 million people bought game stock the next day, they would have to maybe put $50 million. So at some point they had to do something you know, either raise capital or stop the trading because if they had more game stock on their books, they would have to put more capital with their with the regulators. So Robin Hood, and I say Robin Hood, there's a few other uh, small discount brokers. They all took the position, you know what? Uh, we don't want to go bankrupt here. So we're just going to cool things down. And, uh, and, uh, we're not going to allow these trades. If there's no more trades on these stocks, the company doesn't have to put more capital. So they're not in danger of, of going under or anything like that. So to, to complete the story is that if you had been dealing with Canaccord or Royal Bank or Bank of America. Uh, Let's stick to Canaccord. Let's just stick to Canaccord as an or, example. Yeah, yeah a large, a large uh, billion dollar company with lots and lots of capital. They would have never made you stop by a game stock and all that because they're well capitalized. Okay. So it's my point is it's not the regulators, it's the firm that these people were dealing with. Yeah, there, there's a lot to unwind there, Claude. And, and, and like, maybe I should just start start by saying for, for us, for example, for me at Canaccord, I never got an email, I never got any mention saying that, hey, Rob, you can't buy GameStop shares for your clients anymore. I don't know if. I never tried to, I never tried to buy shares, but I know that, you know, that wasn't happening at our firm because again, we're well capitalized. Uh, our earnings came out today. They were unbelievable. We're extremely well capitalized. So, you know what, can accord, it's, it's a non-issue. It's a non-concern. Plus our advisors likely were not buying GameStop at $300, $482. But I do want to get back to your point about the, the capitalization. Now, if I'm just straight up long, if I'm just buying, I have $5,000 in my account and I'm buying $5,000 at GameStop, and it's 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 fully it's not on margin it's it's just i'm straight long who cares how well capitalized i am what about that argument Claude? right the, the, the brokerage firms never stop that part yeah so this is the point i want to get to so the margin requirements and the capitalization requirements are largely impacted by the amount of shorts and at the firm and the option strategy at the firm because if you buy an option right? And let's say you're selling a put um, or sorry, if, let's say you're, yeah, you could be selling a put or, or if, whatever, if you're short, either one, the loss is endless, right? Like the potential loss is endless. So I might say, I might sit here and say, uh, you know, Robin Hood, I, I have $5,000 here. Uh, how much can I short GameStop? And they might say, what would they say, Claude? 50% or? Yeah, they'll say, we'll let you short, uh, uh, $2,500 away. Right? $2,500 to start. And I go, well, that's ridiculous. I got five grand here. Why can't I short five grand worth? And they'd say, well, you know, the stock could move and then we need to be protected. Now, when there's volatility, like the volatility we saw, the amount of capital you need to put for shorts and for option positions needs to be dramatically more. Why? Because at the end of the day, if I have $5,000, I'm a 22 year old and I go short and I'm down 500 grand on my position, which could easily happen, right? It could easily happen. Or I have options and I'm down a ton. I'm personally broke. I can't pay 500 grand. So who's left holding the bag? It's Robin Hood. It's the firm. That's why they impose restrictions. That's why they impose capital limitations because we do not want firms to go insolvent. We do not want firms to go bankrupt. And it's one thing to say, we're just going long, blah, 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 but that doesn't happen in reality. And it certainly doesn't ha didn't happen this time. And the amount of volume of shares that GameStop represented for Reddit will never, for sorry, for Robinhood, will never know, Claude, but I imagine it's a big number. Like I imagine they started with, you know, maybe 1% of their entire assets. And then over time, Boom, boom, boom. You're piling on, you're piling on. Two things are happening. You're piling on cash 
and you're buying more shares. But not only that, the shares are doubling every day, right? So it becomes, you know, 1%, 2%, then 5%, then 10 then 20 then 40 And I, I imagine it was such a big risk, and you speculated on this. Now, let's talk about, you said, I, I used to own a firm. Now, I want to ask you, you owned an investment brokerage, an IROC licensed investment brokerage dealership. You own the firm. Uh, it was, you know, I don't know, 15 years ago or whatever when you guys sold. Um, did you ever have a situation like this happen at your firm where the regulators came and said, you're too long on, a, you're too short on a position. We don't like the capital requirements. We, we need, like, did you ever have that discussion with the regulators? Well, it, it was an ongoing discussion because the regulators force us to file uh, during quiet times, a weekly report, you know, on all your positions. And first of all, they can see the, the positions right to our back office. And if, if they smell or, you know, have suspicion, that all of a sudden, if the regulators saw that our little firm went from owning a thousand shares of GameStop to being short a hundred thousand shares of GameStop, we would have had a, a telephone call the very same day saying, you know that to the margin now on GameStop is now like like 200%. So you have a million shares. So either you get rid of those positions or give us more capital, give us another three or four million dollars of capital if you want to continue doing that kind of activity. And, so and you're the owner, thing. Right? you own the firm with a, you know, you're a partner in another firm. So you would have had to say, what do we do guys? Do we, do we mortgage our houses? Do we, you know, how do we come up with five, 10 mil? And maybe you say, we can't do it. We don't want to do it. And maybe you say, Hey guys, no more shorting GameStop, right? You hit it on the nail. Is that at some point the owners or the partners or the, the stakeholders of our firm. The lenders potentially? Yeah, we, we said, like, we all know how much capital we have in case something like that happens. We have a long-term plan. And, and we've always said, if, if something like that happens, we're going to cut our losses short uh, or decide how much capital we're going to put in. But a thing like game stock is there was, like, we would never had have had any choice enough capital to meet the regulation so we would have had to stop the shorting of game stock would you have ever been put in a situation you think where they would have called you and said not only do you have to stop the short you got to close out your positions well yeah the short positions are are, are a lot more more dangerous so the regulations are a lot stricter if we're strictly long and everybody's paid for and they're they're not on margin you could probably keep it forever, right? Because there's no risk. The, the most you can lose is if you own a thousand shares, a thousand dollars of a stock. If it goes to zero, you lose your thousand, but you've already paid for it. So yeah, no it's just the investor. It. It's just the investor that loses his thousand dollars. Yeah, the firm has no risk. But if that person shorts a thousand, he's got a thousand in his account, and he shorts a thousand, and then all of a sudden the, it goes up to from. Uh, the loss is a thousand to a hundred thousand. Well, we know the investor won't be able to pay, so we're gonna have to put that money with the regulators. So we're gonna stop shorting of, of a dangerous stock. And I know just from association with you, we, we talk about the idea that an investor, you know, a 20 year old investor on Reddit, uh, you know, opens an account, shorts a stock, and actually goes bankrupt. We think that's impossible, right? Like, there's no way that ever happens. Like I know that happens with investment firms. You know that that happens with investment firms, and I can guarantee you, it happened with some redditors, right? Like Robinhood is holding the bag for sure for some individual investors that personally went bankrupt, like for sure, for sure. right? Like hundred sure. percent that happened. Yeah. It might not be a lot. It might be yeah. you know a hundred grand. But if someone's worth two grand and they're down a hundred grand, they're broke. And how are they down that much? It's leverage, right? If you're shorting yeah. or if you're dealing in options, it's yeah. leverage. Or if you're doing it on margin, right? Yeah. So, so, so a good investment firm, uh, you know, has a has risk officers that are monitoring that all the time, and as soon as they see that, hey, we're we're getting close to a potential risk here, they need to act, and they have two choices all the time: put more capital, or stop the speculation. Yeah, or yeah, and end the position, close the position, yeah. right? Yes. Now, I want to ask you about the regulators, Claude. In your heart of heart, you talked about why you thought, and you're speculating. I know you are. Uh, so do you think in your heart of heart, the regulators strictly did it to protect the, 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 
the firm to protect uh, the the Robin Hood and the discount brokerage from insolvency, from not going bankrupt, and therefore the trickle effects that that would have had on the market. Because let's be honest, if a firm like Robin Hood went belly up, forget about this whole GameStop story. And by the way, Claude, I, I got to correct you. I, I think you've said it five times, GameStop. I kind of like GameStop, but it's, it's GameStop. Um, but anyways, like the, the ripple effects that that would have, a firm like Robin Hood actually being insolvent because of trading, I think would be significant, much more than we could possibly expect right now. But do you think in your heart of heart they did it for that reason? Or do you think in your heart of heart they did it to protect the small investor? Well, the regulator is there to protect in the end the investor. And the way to protect the investor is is, is to have firms that are well capitalized and that nobody goes under. To, to right, but forget think. about that. Forget about the, the the fact that the insolvency might happen. I mean, the guy who's the gal who's putting two thousand dollars, her entire net worth, his or her entire net worth, in GameStop, right? Because they, you know, they weren't able to buy. They weren't able to buy on Friday or Monday. So, do you think the regulators, in their heart of heart, wanted to prevent that person from further ruining their personal net worth in buying more GameStop shares at four hundred bucks? Or do you think they care? Well, they do care. However, I'm going to answer it this way. Um, there's two types of investment firms. There, there's, there's the investment firms where there's fiduciary duties and, and people meet their clients, uh, like, for example, Rob. And Rob has a, a fiduciary obligation to know his client. And therefore, if Rob starts doing those kind of transactions, the regulators will go after Rob and give the clients their money back, okay? But the difference here is the the Robin Hood type of or the discount brokers where it they they know ahead of time that they're not going to get advice. They're strictly they open up an account. It's a trading can, platform. It's just a trading platform. Yeah, it's just a trading to put orders. They don't give any advice and therefore um the the the, the companies are not responsible if you buy a stock that you should not buy so it's it's uh so there's two types of regulations so there's there's the discretionary portfolio managers like you rob where the onus is on you so they regulate you and they're not worried about the little guy because they're going to come after you if ever there's a problem not the yeah, little pause. guy yeah quick pause on that quick pause cool. yeah like had i bought GameStop at $482 in a discretionary account for a client, I'd probably be liable for that loss. I would imagine, uh, you know, if it, as, as it falls here and as it goes down on a discretionary basis, had I done that, I think I would have had exposure. Uh, absolutely. You know, maybe not, maybe if you had a client that had a hundred million, you'd be okay for that client. But the other 99% of the average people for sure, you'd be uh, the regulators. If there was a huge problem, they'd come after you. And um, that's what it is. However, the discount brokers is a different story because when you sign up, uh, you know, it's a long story on why they've allowed the discount brokers to, to behave in this manner when it comes to consumer protection. But basically, it's to save on fees, right? Because you can trade at a discount broker for $9 a trade or $5 a trade. It, but the, the discount broker saying it's only a platform. Look, we're not giving you advice. So if you buy a crappy stock and it goes to zero, it's your problem. It's not our problem. So the the regulators have no say in stopping the the discount brokers like Robinhood from stopping trade. The only way they, the only reason they made them stop the trades was the capitalization and the integrity of our industry so firms do not go bankrupt. Do you think that there's an interest here to um, to actually uh, protect, I guess, or to, to uh, protect the integrity of the market in that these trades are not fair? First of all, do you think what these guys did is unfair and, and is it market man manipulating? No, it's it's not unfair. I don't think and so either. It's not market manipulating. Yeah, it's not market manipulating. So second no. of all, do you think that they need to consider this market? Do you think there's any interest in the regulators to put an end? Like the headlines all say it all the time. You read on BNN or on CNBC or whatever, uh, you know, regulators looking at stopping this behavior in the future. Do you, what do you think of that? Well, 
Are they going to close the internet? <laughs> Only in Marchand, Claude. Only. In no. Marchand. Yeah, but I guess my point is, is that the, the, there's freedom. So if 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 you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff being said on chat rooms saying, you know, buy ABC stock, it's going to the moon. And if people don't do their due diligence and they go ahead and buy it. It's like buyer beware. If you deal with a discount broker, uh, you're giving up your right to to have advice and to be protected. So, as a, as a, as an investor, if you're sophisticated, sure, go ahead. If you want to uh, deal with a discount broker, you have you don't have any protection. Of, of course, the 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 the, more, the brokerage firms got to execute your trades and all of that stuff. But I mean. They have no liability in the sense that to warn you, they you shouldn't buy game stock or you shouldn't short game stock. Whereas when you deal with a, 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 a discretionary portfolio manager, he's regulated by his fiduciary duty that he must advise you. And as a matter of fact, if if he thinks and he knows for sure, or in his mind based on his professional status, that 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 client is should not do it he has a duty to not let the client do it yeah and in fact i did that right like i got yeah. I don't know, five or six phone calls yeah from clients who wanted to buy gamestop at all cost and i i told them straight up i'm not doing that here for you if that means you transferring your account out that's fine um but i i can't in good conscience put this trade in for you because i know as you always say i know how this ends i don't know how the middle game plays out i know how it starts it starts with a short squeeze and I know how it ends. Everyone's selling their shares and the price going back down to where it was before, but I don't know what happens in between. Now let's talk about that. I took a look at the volume, Claude. Uh, the volume of the, the you know, we're getting about a half the volume right now of the shares today at about a quarter of the price that we were getting on Friday. So we're talking like one eighth, uh, yeah, one eighth of the money moving hands. The vast majority of money in this tr trade moved between 250 and $400, probably for an average of I don't know, 300 or something like that. So that means two things. It means one, you can't have a trade without two sides, right? So that means there were a lot of buyers, a lot of buyers at 300 bucks, 350 bucks, 482 bucks, but there were also a lot of sellers. So how do you think that played out in your mind? Who do you think was on what side? And then I want to ask you the ones that are still holding how this ends for them emotionally, which is a question I asked you earlier, but I'm coming back to it. First of all, uh, who, how do you think that played out? The buyers and the sellers, who do you think were who there? Well, the answer is I absolutely don't know because if a stock uh, pays no dividends and it starts at 30. No, 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 Claude, that's not my question. I said, who who are the buyers and who are the sellers at the top? I, I was kind of leading you towards something along the lines of, I think that the sellers were the initiators, the ones who kind of created this thing, who closed out their positions at the top and the buyers were the late arrivals to the party, the ones who were just reading on Reddit. They were the ones buying. They were the ones buying the shares from the ones that they were reading the post on. That's that's what I think happened. Do you understand yeah. what I'm asking? Yeah, but I, I don't know. I mean, uh, it, it's such yeah, neither a- neither do I. We're just speculating, Claude. We're just speculating. You it's, want me to speculate? Sure. Uh, I, I think that the, 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 the early guys on Reddit, and uh, they were joined by professionals at a certain point, uh, you know, when, when, when this became obvious, um, but, if, if the guys who did this, who could orchestrate this, they knew what they were doing. I think they got out and make a lot of money. So I think that 10%, like, I'm just going to speculate here. I think that about 10% of the people in the last two weeks that have traded GameStop made money and 90% have lost. Yeah, I think, I think... I agree. I think that there's the, the, the unsophisticated investor, I don't think is going to make out great here. The, the individual who bought shares for the first time in his life, I talked about it last week on Wednesday. I, I took a screenshot of the comment. I sold all my Amazon and my Google stock and I loaded up on GameStop today. I'm in at 362 bucks. And I was just like, oh, that hurt. Like that hurt to read that, especially after seeing the Google earnings and the Amazon earnings this week. Um, you know, why would you do that? Why would you sell companies that are growing their, their cash flow at 20%? And replace it with anyways but um now those individuals Claude, let's talk about those individuals because probably at some point in your life you've been in a stock that was high 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 and then went low 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 
talk about the emotional impact of that. And what, what are these guys? What do you think these are? These guys going to just hold on now because of loss aversion? I think there's this this bias that exists in the stock market that you know what you paid for a stock, right? I know I paid 360 bucks and therefore I can't sell at 80 or 90. That's ridiculous. Like it's, I paid 380 for it. So I think there is a lot of loss aversion and I think it's a bias, even though the market doesn't care what you paid for your stock. What do you think is going to happen with the, the ones that are kind of still holding on uh, over the next weeks here? Well, they're going to re they're going to sit back and think, you know, what did I do here and what did I do wrong? And, um, uh, you know, if, if the people that want to move on that, you know, are reasonable, they, they, they'll analyze this thing and say, you know what, next time uh, I'm going to do a little more research before I buy a company. Uh, but, you know, whereas the unreasonable people will lay the blame on somebody else, they're, gonna, they're not going to learn and they're going to say, you know what, I got screwed and it's not my fault. The firm didn't let me sell. The firm didn't let me buy. Uh, but the reasonable people, I think, will 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 come to 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 understand their mistake. Do you, they're going to exit? You think they're going to understand yeah, and exit? I, position? I, they they might not exit, but but they'll remember for the rest of their lives, right? That uh, hey, wow, I bought something at four hundred, and three days later, uh, you know, it was at fifty dollars, and uh, you know, and I don't know why I, I bought it. I don't know why. Like I just read a post somewhere that said. Let's get the big guys or, you know, let's teach these guys a lesson. Like nobody on these posts say, you don't buy GameStop because, you know, they, they've, they've changed their business style. They're, they're going to double, triple their money. Oh, okay. Then you buy that and it makes sense. That's too but, boring, Claude. That's way too boring. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's okay. Well, well, investing, investing your, 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 your money, all your money and your, your children's money is not a game. Yeah, who, I don't know if you're talking to me or if you're yeah, talking, talking to you. It's, it's not a so game. You're talking to me, okay? Yeah, I'm yeah. aware, Claude. You Hello. can't, you can't take it lightly. You just like like a fool on his money will soon part, right? If 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 you just oh somebody says on on a uh, let's get these guys to do that buy a hundred shares of this and you do that, like you know what you're not gonna have money much longer. I do think it's a good lesson to be learned, and I do think that there's. Um, I remember you asking me one of the first days, you're like, do they think that this is a PS5 game where you just play for a bit and then you get your money back at the end, right? You play for a bit and, oh, that was fun. And then you just get everything you put in back. Like, um, I think there might have been some of that. I don't think you could possibly, I don't think you could possibly explain to everyone the concept that I talked about last week, which is GameStop in their lifetime as a publicly traded company has made $13 of profit, 13 in 19 years of a, being a publicly traded company, including 10 consecutive quarters of negative growth, 60 cents per year. If you own that at $400, you would need 600 years of profit before you broke out even. I don't think if, like if someone could have just put that into a 10 second TikTok or a 20 second TikTok and put it on uh, my TikTok account and, you know, I, would we have prevented some damage? Probably not, right? There was no, there was no reasoning. I don't think, right, Claude? Yeah, no, I. It's it's beyond me. All the you know, and I read those posts too because I'm in the business. I got to keep informed. And and I'm how much time do you spend? In, do you spend in the Wall Street bets forum on Reddit? Well, I, you have to look at it, like just to you know, like to to keep current. And you know, not once did I ever see a post that said. You know, let's buy GameStop because they've got new management. Uh, they've got new, you know, they're going online. Their earnings will double in the next five years and buy it for that. The, every single post that I ever saw was, let's get the hedge funds. It did, uh, it did start out a little bit like that, Claude. It did start out a little bit with, you know what, this they're in the penalty box. It's not that right. To be fair to GameStop, today they announced that they're, you know, they recruited a new, I think it's a CMO, a chief marketing officer. I think they, they brought in some new staff. I do believe they have um, one of the former leads from Amazon um, Web Services. Uh, so, I mean, they're doing, I think, the right things. Uh, GameStop, they're trying to show that they're actually trying to make it as a company. Um, but, I mean, what do you do? If you were GameStop, what would you do, Claude? If I was the company? I would have raised money at four hundred dollars a share. Yeah, 
I mean, that was a crazy opportunity just to, to, to raise capital. Okay. So now you got, <laughs> you got all this cash, you pay down the debt. And then what do you do? Would you buy another company? Would you, no, would you, you either, that special distribution? Yeah. Like, like I'm not an expert on game stock, like, but I assume they got this new manager, Mr. Cohen, uh, he's renowned as being, uh, he's going to turn around that company. And if he had all the capital in the world, he might expand faster. I, I'm not sure if, if there's no need for capital. But you would have for sure raised capital. Pardon me? You would have for sure raised capital. Yeah, because if, if okay, one thing you never mentioned, I think, anywhere, is that the insiders all sold at around between 25 and 30. Yeah, I so, mentioned it last week. Okay. So if, if the owners of the company are selling their own business for $25 and they know what's going on, uh, you know, why should you be buying it at $482? So, uh, uh, so they should have raised, like I say they should have, maybe they couldn't legally. I'm not I think sure, there might've been I know an that. Yeah. I think yeah. there could have been an issue with the, uh, yeah. the, the ethics behind, you know, what would they have done with the capital? I do believe if you raise capital, you need to, you know, kind of say what you're going to do with it. Um, where do you think, uh, this goes from here, and I know you've already said you don't really want to answer that, but I'm going to try to ask you again. Where do you think this goes from here in terms of this, the price? How long do you think this takes to play out? I'm not asking for a prediction on on price in a week, in a month, or a year. I think I said last week I would eat my shorts if it was at 360 bucks in a year. I'm not asking you to do that, uh, but like, how do you think this plays out over the next while here? Okay. The price. Well, of I, I'm going to start by saying. I know the beginning of that story and I know the end. So if, if the story started when the stock was was $20 and nothing has changed, the end of the story, well, the stock will be at $20 plus or minus um, the economic gains that the company's made during while this story unfolds. Yeah, because of the brand, because of, of yeah. capital, because yeah. of whatever. So, so a good company that doubles in a year, I mean, that's outstanding. So... You know, maybe it's $40. I, I don't know. And I'm not suggesting that the stock will come down to 40 tomorrow morning. Uh, no, and by the, way, by the way, we're not making any predictions on the stock. We're not your advisors. Don't trade on any of this. Don't trade on this advice. Talk to your investment advisor before making any moves. Talk to us if you want. Go to www.speaktorob.com. We'd love to book a no-obligation consultation if you'd like. But these are not predictions. Go ahead, Clue. Yeah, so, so I was just going to say, the one thing I don't know for the one thing I know for sure is I do not know for sure uh, the middle of the story, how long it'll take. You know, will it take a month? Will it take six months? Uh, but my previous experience shows that the if, if you drew a graph or a chart of how long it took to go from 30 to 480, normally the other side is almost equal the same in my experience. Okay, so if, if it if it only took two weeks. To, if it only took one month to go from 30 to 480, uh, my, if I had to, to bet money and guess, like your best guess, like how long exactly will it take? I, I would say around the same amount of time as it started, as in the way down. But And again, we don't know. We're just speculating here and yeah. don't act on that advice. Um, hey, Claude, have you ever been caught in a short squeeze? <laughs> uh Yes. <laughs> Tell us how it went, if you well, want. You know, you, you think, uh, I thought I knew everything, right? Back in January of 1989. And uh, uh, we didn't have computers like today. And, you know, you didn't have all these, these business channels. But um, these promoters were, were calling all the time and visiting us. Uh, we were stockbrokers and, and saying that, you know, the stock was 20 cents and it was a potential gold mine at that time. That, that That's the one I actually, this is a real life story. And he said, you should buy our stock. You know, we're going to find gold and we'll be the biggest gold mine in the world. I'm just, I'm just over exaggerating their story. And they say, you know, buy the stock. You'll see it'll be at, at 50 cents, you know, in a month or two weeks. And, but I didn't buy it because I speculated a little bit, but not that much. And then over the space of about two or three months, uh, they kept calling and the stock kept going up and, you know, and then one day hit $5 and, you know, I went over the financial statements and all of that. And I talked to the, the company president, uh, you know, they, they hadn't even 
put a spade in the ground yet to find gold. Like they were, they had just raised a bit of money. True and, and speculative were, company. Pardon me? A true speculative company, no earnings yeah, yet. It, it was a penny stock. So being as smart that I was, uh, I decided to short it at $5 because I knew it was worthless. And in the end, by the way, it would came back to 20 cents. But anyways, so I shorted it at 20 and at I got bucks. caught in a short squeeze and here's how it happened. You shorted it at five bucks. At $5. Yeah. In real life. Okay. So then, and then a couple of days later, the stock went up to six and then seven. So I had a margin call. They said, look, you got to put more, more in your account or close it. Uh, but being stubborn, I said, you know, that stock is worthless. It's going to come down. So I sold my Amazon stock. I, Amazon didn't exist, but my bank stock or my blue chip stock, okay, to, to pay for my margin. And then another couple of days, first thing you know, it's at $10. And I'm not going to buy it at 10 when I sold it at 5 when I think it's worth $0.20. Cents. So I sold some more of my stocks to cover the margin. And then one day about this, – this only lasted about – a bit like GameStop, about 14 days, the whole story. And, you know, a few days later, the, 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 the credit department, who are the ones in charge of – in order to short, you have to borrow stock to give to the buyer. And I did everything right. When I shorted the stock, I went to the credit department, and I said, can I short the stock? Have we got shares that I can borrow to give to the buyer who bought my, my, my shares? And they said, yeah, we got lots. Don't worry about it, Okay. Uh, so there you go. But about seven or eight days later, when the stock was around $13, $14, the credit department called me and said, uh, Chloe, we have a problem. We have no more shares to lend. And whoever bought your shares, they want them back. So you've got 48 hours to, to, to borrow shares from a friend or, you know, or from somebody or buy them in the market, but we, we can't let you have your short anymore. So, uh, the way it actually happened is that the credit department, they phoned around all the brokerage uh, computers were at that time. And, you know, the next day I said, no, I'm not buying it because it's, it's ridiculous. Give me more time. In those days, regulations weren't as strict. They gave you a little more time. So a couple of days later, by then the stock had gone to 20 and it was a thinly traded stock. It only traded a few thousand shares a day. So, you know, it would go up by a dollar at a time, even though it was a 20 cent stock. And so, so the firm said, we'll give you two more days. So rather than take my loss and leave, I, I sold. Okay. I do know how this story ends. So if Claude doesn't come back, I could probably tell it because he has told it to me a few times. Um, he borrowed. I'm pretty sure he borrowed money. I'm pretty sure he had some sleepless nights. I'm pretty sure he went to see, you know, whoever he could, sold whatever stocks he had, cleaned out his entire portfolio. Um, and I'm pretty sure, oh, he's just coming back here. So basically, oh, here we go. Yeah, so I'm just, I'm almost done. So so I delayed one more day and then one my, and then the, the firm said, look, if you don't cover by three o'clock this afternoon, uh, we're buying you in at the opening at 8.30 tomorrow morning. I tried to buy it. It was up to about $30, $34. And, uh, you know, instead of putting a market order, I had priced it. I never got filled. So the next morning, the credit department bought my shares and they ended up paying $50 for my shares. Okay. So I had $50 to for your shares that you had borrowed and sold short at five bucks. Right. So you lost, lost 10 times your money. Exactly. And it, it, it didn't quite ruin me. I'm still here, I guess. But uh, it, it, you know, we all have scars, right? And when you have a scar, you look at it and you remember what happened, right? You know, and uh, th this is a big scar for me. I'll never forget it the rest of my life. And uh, so that's how I got my degree in, in shorts and, and short squeezes. The hard way. I would imagine on that trade, you must have been the absolute top, right? Because if they put a market order... Yeah, absolutely. The, the, the stock order, rallied to 50 bucks, and that was my it. Order, on my order, because you could track, the, you know, on my order. I mean, they were doing this with other people, but um, I actually paid the all-time high for that stock. And literally, 
I forget if it's a month or two later, it was back down to 20 cents. Yeah. So that's not fun. Um, and I mean, if this I weekend, had, if I had had unlimited capital, like the hedge funds or whatever, and I would have kept putting money, uh, I would have made up money, but that's why having capital is so important. There, right. Charlie, your son, my brother called me on the weekend, said, Rob, I listened to your thing. Incredibly smart guy, my brother and said, uh, you know, we both know this stock is going down. We're sure of it. Why don't we just clean out our portfolio and just short it? And I said, yeah, you can do that. I don't advise you against it for it. He goes, why? why? What am I missing? And I go, I kind of told him the quick version of your story. And I said, what if the stock goes to 500, to 1,000, to 2,000? What are you going to do, Charlie? You're going to sell your house? You're going to, you know, you're going to liquidate every stock in your portfolio? You're going to... Uh, and he said, no, but I mean, you know, maybe I do it for less. And at the end, we kind of both talked about a strategy where you would kind of use 10% of your portfolio or something to try to build something. Anyways, neither of us did it, obviously. Why? Because the short squeeze is so powerful, so yeah. detrimental, so dangerous. And, you know, we had, you know, I guess we learned from you, Claude, but uh, we both didn't do it. And obviously it would have been the best move to make. But I digress. Um, I, I had, a, I had a, a buddy tell me a story about a short squeeze when I was in rookie rookie school getting trained uh, to be an investment advisor, to be a portfolio. This is years ago. He was an older guy who was second career and he was coming back and getting relicensed, told me a story about the 80s. I think it was the 80s or the 70s. He had gone long the A's, short the B's of a company that had dual stocks. And he said the spread. Well, what happened, they announced an offering the next day to just buy the A's and to pay a significant premium and a lawsuit started. Well, the guy had to close out his long, ended up ended up getting a significant margin call. Every day of the stock was going up and up and up. S had, to, had to borrow from his dad, had to sell his car. His wife was wondering what the heck he was doing. He wasn't sleeping. Every morning he would go out and buy a paper at three in the morning to see what the stock closed at because they didn't have tickers. They didn't have it back then. And I uh, had to borrow from his parents, borrow from his buddy, borrow from every possible person he could. Sleep, sleepless nights. Uh, he had a newborn at the time. It ruined his marriage. Uh, it ruined his it ruined his marriage. He lost like most of his assets. He didn't lose his home, but he lost most of his assets. And eventually, he was proven right. But it doesn't matter because in the interim, we don't know how the story plays out. We know how it starts. We know how it ends. But the guy got completely wiped out, lost his marriage lost his house, pretty much lost every single thing he, he had. And uh, he was right. He was right. There's a discrepancy in the shares, but you can't always, uh, in fact, I mean, the hedge funds are, are probably right from time to time, but they're often wrong. Hey, Claude, I want to ask you um, about uh, how this plays out in the future for these investors real quick. So are, are they going to do this again? You think the Redditors? Uh, yeah. I mean, if, I think that the originators, if they see another another stock that's shorted like 80%, 90%, 100%, they're gonna go after them because it, 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 it works, okay? However, in talking to a few fund managers over the last few days, uh, these hedge fund guys now are saying, the rules are changed, we got caught, we're gonna learn. We're, if we have a short position more than 10% of a stock, we're going to eliminate it because we're not going to take the risk of another game stock. So, so it, 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 it's going to change the landscape for the hedge fund managers. They were, they were burnt, they were caught, and they're going to learn from this. It's funny because Andrew left used to use his platform, you know, to belittle a stock or to make fun of a stock, the, the short seller from Citron. He used to, he used to go out, publish a report, go on BNN and say, this company's terrible, this company's terrible, this company's terrible. And just by doing that, the stock would fall, right? Just by doing that, the stock would fall. And he would kind of make money the opposite way that Warren Buffett makes money, right? Yeah. Warren Buffett makes money just by buying a stock. Just the fact that Warren Buffett buys a stock, he's made money. Because when it's announced the next day, the stock's up. So the, the reverse used to happen with Andrew Left. Now he said he's no longer going to announce his shorts. I just, I, I'm blown away by this. I'm blown away that he's not going to use the power. I feel like telling him, you know, buck up a little bit and, and, you know, fight back, but I don't know the guy. And, and obviously he's been burdened. He's changed his mind. 
Yeah, um, because if like Andrew left, and I respect him because I was in Sino Forest about 15 years ago when he's the guy that exposed the scam. He shorted the stock at 25. It was a scam and went down to zero. However, I agree with what with, with he said in that if you if you if you didn't if people didn't announce but but you have to the regulators force you to to put the total short positions then nobody would come after you so if you really think a company is overvalued there's nothing wrong with shorting it as long as it's not 100 percent short and that's that's where those guys made an error in that all of them did the same thing and they got they they overdid it in 2014, I got my first appearance on BNN and it was Andrew Left who had released a report on Valiant Pharmaceuticals. And I went on BNN and I said, where there's smoke, there's fire. I'd read the report. It sounded very sound to me. I did more research. I dug into the financials. I went on BNN three, four times. I said, this is not a good company to own. Sure enough, the stock went from, I, I want to say 300 bucks to like 30 or 40 bucks. And yeah. they eventually had to rebrand and and I, I kind of made my claim to fame. My first kind of call on BNN was was kind of shorting Valiant. Um, and I mean, it's because he made the research report. We would have never known, right? Yeah, and, and there wasn't that many people short. Like he was kind of the first. So there was no possibility of a squeeze there. No possibility of a squeeze. And and also we had a little bit of Valiant. We had a few clients that had kind of yeah. transferred it over or whatever. And like we immediately sold, yeah. right? Took our yeah. profits. And then, you know, we saw what happened. Hey, I want to I want to ask you uh, about um, you make a great analogy about, about at the end of, of uh, kind of a short. Um, you remember you do and if anyone's here ever done an auction where you 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 buy hockey teams for like who's going to win the Stanley Cup and we each have 100 bucks. Right. And at the end, if we've all got 50 bucks and there's only one team left. Right. Guess what? The team's going for a lot of money. You used an analogy one time. I really, really loved it. It's it's the. Uh, the 10 millionaires in the desert or the, the 20 millionaires in the desert for the bottles of water, right? Yeah. You had, compared, you had compared it to what happened in the game stops. Do you remember that analogy? Yeah, because I use it all the time is that uh, it, it's a short term supply and demand, these short squeezes, right? It, it's a short term phenomena. So it's like guys going in the desert. They're told there's a lot of water. They come to the last stop. They haven't had a drink for two days. And they're told that it's the last for another three days and there's one bottle of water left. Okay. And the normal price of water is $1 a bottle. And there's only one left, 10 millionaires. How much do you think the bottle of water will sell for? They'll bid it up to $10 million, right? Because it's their life on the line. So that is a bit of short squeeze analogy. Yeah. The reverse of it. Yeah. I really like that. Um, uh, okay, I, I want to ask you something else about the power of the Reddit community, the power of these we these um, uh, Wall Street betters. So I think there's a bit of an irony here because they bought into GameStop thinking that they're unhappy with something in the world, right? They wanted to stick it to someone. They thought they were sticking it to Wall Street. And instead of using their own capital to invest in things that they believe in and, you know, maybe green energy or maybe... You know, I don't know anything, electric cars or, or you know, plant based protein or whatever it may be, psychedelics, something. They instead, you know, they could have done that and made the world a better place. They decided to dump it effectively into a stock. And the end result is that a lot of people are going to have lost a lot of money in this. And therefore, they've made the planet worst off now because there's less capital in their hands. The capital has moved money. And if you think, that the capital hasn't gone to people that are wealthy. You're, you're, you're probably wrong on that. I think the capital that moved hand here, unfortunately, went from the unsophisticated unwealthy to the sophisticated wealthy. So do you think that it's possible that the next time they go around on this, they would somehow say, okay, forget about us. Let's target a sector. Let's maybe focus on a company that we really like. Let's bring that capital up, the value of the stock up. Let's give the board, the management, an opportunity to raise capital. Let's help them out, raise the stock up. Once the stock is up, they could raise capital. They could pay down debt. They could do something. They can improve our planet. They can improve our life. Am I dreaming or do you think that's possible? Well, here, here's the flaw in your argument is that you don't, this is not a game. You, you don't create artificial wealth for, a, for an Amazon uh, to go from nothing to, to $3,000, 
they've created earnings, they, they've distributed money, they, they, they've created something in this world, and they've, they've created real wealth. You can't decide on Monday morning, we're going to buy Amazon and move it from 1000 to 3000 It's artificial wealth, and artificial wealth disappears. It has to be real wealth. So to answer your question is, yeah, if I'm going to pick on a stock, at least I should pick on a good stock. But... Now that they're used to having a game stock move up 10,000%, they're, they're not going to be around long when it only goes up 10% a year. They're going to give up on that. Yeah, you kind of didn't get my question. So they have the power to move stocks. We agree. For sure. Right? Yeah, we agree. They do. And if you and I had the power to move stocks, you know, what would we do? Well, we'd, we'd make a lot of money, right? But, but, but Rob, what do you mean move stock? Do you mean- They have the ability to move a stock for a short period of time. Yeah. So how, yeah. what good does that do? Well, I mean, if let's say I had a, a, a company I really liked and I wanted them, they have a ton of debt and they're kind of in trouble and they have really good things to do, but they're not profitable. And, you know, you could easily bump up the price of that stock with your with your crowd. You could then- raise capital, you okay. could then pay down debt, you could then, I don't know, create more products or create more marketing expenses or whatever, improve the product, improve the whatever the, the outcome is of that company. That's for sure doable. But that's what we already do. No, but not at the level that these guys are doing. No, too. of course. B because okay. So you think, you think, I'm, you think, I'm not saying I think this will happen. I'm saying, I think if I was them, I think that's what I'd be focused on. How to make the world a better place, right? For sure. Pick a good don't don't pick a loser stock. Pick a good company. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Put that put that on a t-shirt. Don't pick a loser yeah. stock. Um and by the way, on this t-shirt, this t-shirt today says uh buy the fear, sell the greed. Buy the yeah. fear, sell the greed. And a long line of t-shirts uh, that I wear now for these things. Yeah. The reason I'm wearing this one is I mean, we sensed it, Claude. We sense the greed, and we have a barometer, right? Where it's like we can sense when our clients are greedy. We can sense when, you know, the phone calls we're getting, the people we're talking to, uh, you know, the people we see in the streets, although we never see anyone in the streets now, but we could sense. And obviously we were, uh, we were buying the fear and selling the greed, obviously. Yeah. I mean, you and I and the rest of the team uh, during those two weeks, we've, we've probably talked 20 times a day, right? Discussing this thing. Too much, I would say. I'm, I'm, I don't yeah. want to say I'm sick and tired of it for sure, but uh, I do enjoy these the depth of these discussions with you, Claude, because yeah. these are healthy debates, I think, right? Yeah. Um, you talked about uh, what, what do you think of the individuals that are willing, uh, and this might be too much of a far stretch question for you, but what do you think of the individuals? We talked about this this morning with a client uh, that are willing to lose money on a trade in order to trade that for social media following, for for a, a career on YouTube uh, or, or whatever it may be. I, I think I know what you're going to say. They're, they're losers, I think is what you're going to say. No, no. I'm going to say you're asking the wrong person because uh, I don't know enough about social media and how you make money and all of that. I mean, I'm probably average knowledge, but I'm not sophisticated enough to, to, to answer that question. Okay. So uh, I... I think it's a good long-term play. If you can get, you know, half a million followers or a million followers, um, there's a lot of money to be made on YouTube, right? Because the ads are not cheap. Um, last question. Uh, do you think, sorry, first off, make sure to subscribe. Hey guys, take a sec to subscribe, take a sec to like, take a sec to share. Um, if you want to book a no obligation consultation, go to www.speaktorob.com. You can speak to me. You can speak to my wonderful father, Claude, if you'd like. Um, what do you think? By the way, my man's doing great, right? COVID, she's doing good. Yeah, doing excellent. Ninety-five year old, soon to be ninety-six year old 96 grandma. Ninety-six next, 96 next month. Ninety-six next month got COVID yeah. in the Saint Amitié in La Brocrie, Manitoba, yeah. and beat it like crushed it. Beat it like a like a GameStop short. Um, do you think there'll be lawsuits against Robin Hood here for the individuals that lost their money? And do you think they'll have any chance of succeeding? I think there'll be lawsuits, but they won't succeed. Okay. I could comment more on that, but anyways, they won't succeed. Yeah, you don't think so. I mean, there will be a cost, right? There'll be a cost regardless. Yeah. Just yeah. It, 
it's not cheap to have litigation. I know I used to be a litigator. That's what I used to do. I used to sue people for a living. Uh, it was like the amount of, of lawsuits that we started that actually finished with a, like we had like two trials in the three years I was at, at my law firm, like in litigation, that's all I did. And we had like two trials, everything settled, everything got a month, two months, six months, 12 months, five years deep. And uh, it ended up costing and costing and costing. Um, you know, I have a bit of a, like, I get why litigation exists, but I mean, wow, the system is, is flawed. It is broken. Um, anything else, Claude, that's on your mind? No, I, like, I don't want to prolong it, but we've been negative on shorting. Uh, I'm not going to get into it, but there's a healthy dose of shorting out there if it's done properly. Tonight, we were discussing the, the, the short squeeze and the negative effects on the market, but shorting has a place in this market. Yeah, tell me. Tell me what, what place it has. Well, okay. Do you know what the top five shorted stocks in Canada are? I imagine they're the largest cap companies in Canada. Right. So the five Canadian banks, and they're probably the most bluish chip stocks there are. But there's a reason they're shorted is that it has to do with hedging, portfolios, and, and that sort of thing. But most of those shorts are hedged with either call options or put options. And uh, it creates liquidity. There's all sorts of good things of shorting, uh, proper shorting. Anyways. Yeah. I mean, it's the same argument as, you know, if you can borrow a dollar to do something else with it, right? You know, if I want to borrow a dollar, borrow a hundred thousand or a million dollars and buy a house and pay it down over time, I can do that, right? If I want to borrow stock, you know, using my line of credit, using my margin, using my, you know, that that's the theory, right? It's it's not harmful provided it's it's yeah. done well, et cetera. And most of the, there's a lot of shorting now that happens through structured notes as well, through the yeah. bank offered structured notes, tons of shorting that happens through there as well. So it's a, it's a means for uh, the true term hedging, right? Yes. Not, not like hedge funds, true term hedging, which is yes, yes, that's what hedging I your risk, hedging your risk, right? Removing yeah. uh, timing risk with your with your positions. Yeah, and Use uh, it properly, it makes sense. Yeah, I think I could make a devil's advocate argument for you, Claude. That uh, at least I think someone could throw throw a, a, a grenade at you and tell you. We don't need it in the market. Okay, we could well, just put, be on. Put me back on for an hour and I'll debate that with you all night long. Cool. You know what? That's okay. That's a challenge. Producer Mox, here's what we'll do. We'll add it to one of the topics on the list of the boardroom. We got a new show about to start. It's the boardroom. It's going to be like a pardon the interruption type thing. Uh, we got really neat things coming up. We got an unboxing Gretzky, which is... Uh, I'm chasing a 1979 Wayne Gretzky rookie card. Stay tuned for that. That's coming up in the next couple months. You're going to want to follow our Instagram and our Facebook and our, and our uh, YouTube channel for that. Um, we also have, uh, we have some good value videos coming up in the next couple, couple of weeks, couple of months. We've been recording some good ones. So make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, make sure to follow us every morning. I do a three minute market update, three minutes I do. And I explain everything that's happening in the stock market download it. You could podcast it. You could watch it. You could do whatever you want with it. Other than that, I want to thank you, Claude. Uh, I'm incredibly thankful that we found internet for you today. It's so fantastic. Uh, good comment here from Chris Taifei. <laughs> I'm going to show this one. Our buddy Monty. Uh, you and Claude need to do this more often. These convos are awesome. Uh, thanks, buddy. Appreciate it. Uh, Claude, we will get you back on again. Um, I feel like the last eight conversations we've had about this, we could have just recorded and done one of these because we've talked about this so much. And remember, guys, buy the fear, sell the greed. Thanks so much, guys. Uh, Rob Tatro from RobTatro.com, Portfolio Manager at Canaccord Genuity Wealth Management and the Tatro Wealth Advisor Group. If you'd like to book a no-obligation consultation, go to www.speaktorob.com. We are not your investment advisor. Don't take this as investment advice. And if you want to chat, reach out to us, guys. Thanks so much. We will see you in the next vid, in the next live. And I'll make sure that Claude and I can debate the value of shorts generally. Have a great night.